be seated. Good morning. I tell you, it's an honor to preach God's Word this morning. I feel like Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 where it says he came with fear and much trembling. I feel that way this morning. I also feel like Paul in that third verse of 1 Corinthians 2 where he says he doesn't come with his own wisdom and persuasive words, but he just comes with the power of the Holy Spirit. And I'm excited this morning, not because I'm preaching, but because I know God gave me a message for me and for you this morning. I've been excited about it for a long time. If you have a copy of God's Word, I'm going to ask you to turn to the book of Matthew, the fifth chapter. Fifth chapter, beginning of the Sermon on the Mount. Our focal text will be out of verses 10, 11, and 12 in a message just entitled, Blessed Are the Persecuted. I think it's divine this morning that Dr. Nix read out of Romans chapter 12. Bless those who persecute you. And I want to tell you this morning, there's a lot of things I learned as a MDiv student, but there's some things that you can only learn in the ministry itself. So I want to share with you, I think, a word that will encourage you to be ready in the ministry when persecution comes, because it will come. Before we get into our text this morning, I have a twin brother who preached chapel service as a D-Men student, May of 2001, nine years ago. And uh, he's always been ahead of me in everything in life. Uh, even though I came out four minutes into the world before he did, he's been ahead of me in everything else. He didn't run from God's calling as long as I did. And uh, so he preached here first, and even as students, we would follow each other, and he would lead me into some things that I shouldn't be doing. As a fifth grade student at Oak Grove, uh, we had two classes that were separate. We're fraternal twins, but most people would swear we're identical twins. But when I was in the fifth grade, I had second period English and fifth period social studies, and my twin brother Ray had the exact opposite. So we were at home one night studying for both those tests that we had the next day, and my twin brother Ray had a great idea. He said, won't we dress the same, and you go take one test twice, and I'll go take one test twice. And so as I always follow my brother, even in things I shouldn't sometimes, I said, that's a great idea. I said, I'll study for English, you study for social studies. And so we did that. I walked in second period, took the English test with, that I was supposed to be in. I think I made a 96 or a 97, and I told Ray after the second period, I said, how'd you do on your social studies test? And he said, I think I did pretty good. I said, you better do better fifth period when you take it again. Now you know what you've missed, and you'll be taking it with my name, and make sure you do a good job. I said, I'll do the same for you. I can remember like it was yesterday, even though it was a long time ago, sitting in that fifth period class, nervous like I am this morning, taking that test, my hands shaking as I was filling out that test, hoping we wouldn't get caught. And about 10 minutes into the test, not long at all, I felt like somebody was looking at me. And so I looked up from the back of the classroom, and there my brother stood and the teacher from across the hall. And I said, this is not good. <laughs> the teacher motions for me to come to the door. I walked to the door. My brother would never look up at me. Ray had his head down like this. And when I walked up to him, all I heard him say was, I wrote the wrong name on the test. <laughs> and so from that point on, at Oak Grove, through middle school, through high school, we were not allowed to take classes differently. We had to take all of our classes the same. I tell you that because sometimes things don't work out the way you think they will. Sometimes you think you have things figured out. Been in the ministry 10 years. For the first six of those, I was bivocational. I was a college professor and a bivocational youth minister, and I thought I had all the things figured out. Then I came to seminary in 2006 as a commuter going back and forth. God laid on my heart to go full-time as a pastor, so I decided one day a week I would take that, week off from, that day off from the church, and I would travel and work on my MDiv. And I came down to seminary for a workshop in 2006, Red Carpet Week. This is how dumb I am. My first class I ever took was hermeneutics. Had Dr. Mosley and Dr. Stevens were co-teaching hermeneutics. And I walked into that workshop, and when I walked into the workshop, Dr. Mosley thought I was my twin brother Ray. And he said, what are you doing back in school? And I said, that's my twin brother Ray you had. I, I'm, I'm Ricky. I'm his twin brother. He said, well, how long have you been in school? And I said, this is my first class. He said, well, what are you taking hermeneutics for your first class? He said, you had not had Hebrew or Greek? Or I said, no, I've never had a class in Hebrew or Greek. He said, well, you're in a long haul. So that week I stayed in the hotel on campus. And I thought I was going to drive back and forth, but I didn't sleep any, I don't think, that week. Dr. Mosley working on that class. But God has taught me a lot 
in the ministry, but I was sitting in 2007 in servant leadership. Dr. Eccles, great professor, was teaching that class, and he started giving some statistics from 2006 from Dr. Day. And some of those statistics had to do with about 70% of churches were plateaued or declining. Some statistics that really awakened my spirit about what was happening with churches in our world today. But then he said this. He said, one out of four pastors in 2006 were forced to resign. Were forced to resign. I can remember writing that in my notes and thinking about that on my drive home from that workshop, thinking, did they deserve to be fired? Was it ethical issues? Was it moral issues? Or was it just people running pastors off who were doing what God had called them to do. Then he made a statement after that that I wrote down in my notes. He said, 50% of ministers, after they finish their degree, within five years will be out of the ministry. When he made that statement, I thought, if these people are called by God, then why are they out of the ministry within five years? Until I graduated just a few months ago, and I haven't been out but four months now from getting my MDiv, and... God showed me through just circumstances in church why so many people are out of the ministry within five years. You know, it took me almost four years driving one day a week, five hours round trip to come and work on my MDiv. And I thought, I, I've worked way too hard to quit in five years, to go into some other line of work when God's called me to preach his word. And so this morning, I just want to preach a message that God's led in my heart about persecution. We, all, we always think it comes outside the church, but I want you to know it comes inside the church a lot of times as well. There's so many people that think it's just the worldly people outside the church, but there's a lot of so-called Christians inside the church that are just as worldly as those people outside the church. And so I want to share with you out of the Sermon on the Mount, I'm going to keep it in context. So let's begin in verse 1 of Matthew chapter 5. This is, in my opinion, the greatest message ever preached because it was preached by the greatest preacher to ever preach, Jesus Christ himself. And some people call this the Constitution of Christianity, the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, 6, and 7. If that's true, then the Beatitudes have to be the preamble to the Constitution. Verse 1, Now when he saw the crowds, he went upon a mountainside and he sat down. The disciples came to him and he began to teach them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called sons of God. And here's our focal text in verse 10. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you and falsely say all kind of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Now, I don't know how many of you studied the Sermon on the Mount. It's an incredible passage of Scripture, especially the Beatitudes here. And a lot of times people get confused when it says, blessed are, and some even translations of God's Word say, happy there. Well, if you listen to John Stott's commentary on the message on the Sermon on the Mount, he says, blessed does not mean happy, even though some translations render it that way, he says. He says, happiness is a subjective state, a feeling. But Jesus is not declaring how people feel. Rather, he's making an objective statement about what God thinks about them. D.A. Carson, his commentary on the Sermon on the Mount, says, blessed is a positive judgment by God on the individual that means to be approved or to find approval. So when God blesses us, he approves us. Now, if you ever thought about it that way, when you read the Beatitudes, approved by God are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Sounds kind of funny this morning because a lot of times we think our approval is based on what we do, but we all know we're approved by God not based on what we do, but what God has already done for us in Christ Jesus. He sent his son to die for us, and we become a child of God. He sees us as approved. And so the eight Beatitudes are telling us how we should live because Christ lives in us. It's describing qualities of a believer. That's why at the end of every one of them it talks about heaven, our final destination. Verse 3 again, the result of being poor in spirit, the kingdom of heaven. Verse 4, blessed are those who mourn, they will be comforted. We'll find the greatest comfort of all in heaven. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. 
We know God's Word says that the new heaven is going to be brought to this earth one day, and we will inherit that for all eternity. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Better translation, they will be satisfied. Our ultimate satisfaction comes in heaven for all eternity. Blessed are the merciful, for they'll be shown mercy. Oh, we will see the utmost mercy in heaven. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. One day we will see God face to face. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called sons or children of God. In verse 10, blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. The Beatitudes teach us how we should live because we are God's children, which means this. We will face persecution for being God's children. We will. You know, I wasn't ready for that in ministry. I was ready for it outside the church, but I wasn't ready for it inside the church. But lately, so many things have been happening in my life personally and people that I know. In fact, three of my friends that are pastors in the last month have been asked to leave their church as pastor. Two of those were standing up for God and doing what the Bible commands us to do as Christians and were asked to leave. The other one committed some ethical issues, ethical sins, and was asked to resign. Let me read a blog a friend of mine wrote. He entitled it, Hazardous for Your Health. And then he put under that the Surgeon General's warning with the picture of that warning. And he says this, I propose United States Surgeon General issue the following warning to all those who desire to serve the Lord in the ministry. Warning, serve as a minister of the gospel may cause headaches, nausea, panic attacks, loss of sleep, loss of work, loss of income, loss of joy, which is, you're going to see is not true this morning, followed by fits of rage, fits of anger, fits of irritation, which may produce periods of bitterness, ill will, and despair. Then he goes on to say, ministry is a serious business, and it can be detrimental to your health. He says, case in point, I received a phone call from a young pastor I know. This is dated January the 8th of this year. He says, he called to express concern for his brother, who is also a pastor. He says, I've known both of these young men since they were in high school. They are now both married with children, seminary trained, serving as very capable ministers in their prospective churches. The brother was concerned for his sibling pastor because the deacons are planning to meet Sunday night to ask him to resign. Apparently, the deacons are upset because a racially mixed couple joined the church last weekend. When confronted as to why he would allow someone, quote, like that in their church, the young pastor reminded the deacon the gospel of Jesus Christ is for all people. Ouch. Sad story, isn't it? This blog goes on to say, It's sad that racial prejudice runs so deep that it would cause a group of deacons to take it upon themselves to run their young pastor out of town. It says, Moreover, how will this affect the couple who joined? I pray the Lord guards their eyes, their ears, and their hearts. As soon as the first conversation ended, I called this brother under fire. I listened. He talked. I encouraged. We prayed. Then as we concluded our conversation, I reminded him he was in good company. Jesus said, Blessed are you when others revile you, persecute you, and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. So we read our text, Matthew 5, 11 and 12. Then he ends with this in his blog. So for those who believe you're called into the ministry, beware. Ministry is dangerous to your health. I want you to know if God has called you in the ministry, you will be persecuted. You will be persecuted. And God's Word teaches us out of this text how to handle persecution the way He wants us to handle persecution. So let's look at that this morning. Two truths from this passage of Scripture, Matthew 5, 10, 11, and 12. Here's the first truth, very simply. Persecution will come. Persecution will come. And I'd like to add, even from within inside the church, it will come. Why will it come? Two reasons straight from our text this morning. Number one, it will come because of righteousness. Look again at verse 10 of Matthew chapter 5. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. One reason why we'll be persecuted is for Living right before God. 
Righteousness can be defined as living straight in a crooked world. And God's Word says when we try to live according to His will, that we will face persecution for the life that we live. 2 Timothy 3.12 says, In fact, everyone, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Everyone who desires to live right before God will face persecution. And see, I was blind to the fact that I thought, hey, that's just from the world. And I started looking at Scripture and look at the disciples, and we'll mention them in a minute, that were persecuted. You know who persecuted them the most? Religious people. Religious people. And it's sad to say today in, in the world in which we live, it's hard enough to go up against the enemy and share Christ with this lost and dying world, but when you have to battle people in the own church to do that, that's why it's so hard today. And so God's Word warns us we will face persecution for the life that we live. The second reason why we'll be persecuted is in verse 11 of Matthew 5. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you. Look at the last three words in the NIV. Because of me. We'll be persecuted for the life that we live, and we'll also be persecuted for the Lord that we love. Jesus says, because of me. I don't know about you, but no one likes to sign up for persecution. You don't get a hearty amen when you say, blessed are those who are persecuted. We don't want to face persecution, but God's Word tells us we better be ready for it and not surprised when it does come, because it will come for the life that we live and for the Lord that we love. Then we see in verse 12, or verse 11, excuse me again, three ways persecution comes. It comes because of the Lord we love and the life we live, but it also comes in three different manners that are described for us in verse 11. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kind of evil against you because of me. The first one, people will insult us. In the Greek language, it describes casting an insult in someone's face. To chide someone, to taunt someone. That means to get in someone's face because they are living the way God wants them to and because they love the Lord and insult them. A pastor that I know at this church that's going through this situation has been cussed out at the bank in the town because people do not want someone of a different color in the church. Everywhere the person goes in town, he seems like he runs into someone who wants to get up in his face and insult him. We shouldn't be surprised at that because God's Word says in Matthew chapter 5 that that's how people persecute us for the Lord that we love and the life that we live. Second, it says, persecute you. Same word persecute that you see in verse 10. And that word persecute means to chase someone down like you were chasing an animal down to pursue it until you catch it and then you kill it. Persecute. A physical assault. And if that's not enough, the last way that we're persecuted says they'll falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. They'll gossip, they'll lie, they'll spread rumors. In this story, this true story that I read to you off the blog about a pastor who was persecuted because of just trying to reach lost people for the kingdom of God. Lies have been spread around that church so much, it's unbelievable. One lie that was spread was the pastor paid the couple of thousand dollars to come to church. That the pastor was trying to interrace the church and was trying to make a statement, and so he went out and paid them a thousand dollars. Another rumor was that the pastor went into the black community down the street and went to every house in the black community and knocked on every door trying to get people to come to church. What's funny about that rumor is, number one, it wasn't true, but number two, Jesus Christ said he came to seek and save the lost. And the scripture also says, Jesus says, as I came, so I send you. Which means that's what we're supposed to be doing as Christians is going to people and sharing the good news with them. But lie after lie was spread in this situation, which shouldn't be a surprise because God's word tells us it will happen. People will insult us. People will persecute us. This happened in the state of Mississippi as well at a different church. This happened six months ago. 
Six months ago, a pastor had a vacation Bible school at a small church of about 50 people. And in this small church, three little black girls came to vacation Bible school. Well, the following Sunday, one of those little girls showed up to church. A deacon approached the pastor and told the pastor to go ask the little girl to leave. She wasn't welcome there. To which the pastor said, I'm not doing that. God's called me to reach all people. I want, I want that person to accept Christ. I can't turn her away. That was a Sunday. The following Monday, the wife gets a phone call, death threat. So she packs up her children. She's from out of state. She moves back to her parents' house out of state to see how long it's going to take for everything to subside. On Tuesday, okay, two days later, the pastor is riding down the highway at night in his truck. Two people pull up beside him in a pickup truck, shine spot beams at him, trying to use those bright lights to make him go off the road. When he doesn't go off the road, they both get outside the windows on the right side of the truck with shotguns, and they shoot gunfire on the top of his truck. So Wednesday, he rents a U-Haul. He packs up his stuff and leaves. That's six months ago. Sounds like 1950, but it's 2009, 2010. We shouldn't be surprised. God's word says we will be persecuted for the Lord that we love and for the life that we live. Listen to John 15, verse 18 says this. This is right after Jesus says, I'm the vine and you're the branches. You remain in me. Remain in me. Then listen to verse 18. If the world hates you, keep in mind that it hated me first. If you belong to the world, it would love you as its own. As it is, you do not belong to the world, but I have chosen you out of the world. That is why the world hates you. Verse 20, remember the words I spoke to you. No servant is greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you also. They will treat you this way, verse 21, because of my name. There you see it again, second evidence that because of the name of Jesus Christ, we will face persecution. Jesus says the, what happened to him will happen to us. They persecuted Jesus, they will persecute us. It's amazing to me when you look at the Sermon on the Mount, we know there was a crowd there, but who was the teaching for specifically? It was for the disciples. Listen to verses 1 and 2 again. Now when he saw the crowds, he went up on a mountainside and he sat down. His disciples came to him and he began to teach them, saying... I wonder what the disciples felt like when he got to the last beatitude in verse 10. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Do you think they took that to heart? I would say they did. When you look at the way that they died, every one of them except John, who was banished to the Isle of Patmos, died as a martyr. For example, Peter was crucified upside down because he said he wasn't worthy to die the same way his Lord and Savior did. Andrew, history tells us he was crucified and left on a cross, latched or tied to the cross for two days. And as he was on that cross for two days, he was witnessing the passerbys telling them to accept Christ as the Lord and Savior. James, Acts 12, tells us he was killed by the sword. Tradition tells us they used that sword to cut his head off. Philip, tradition tells us that he was among the first apostles to be martyred, that he was stoned to death in what is present-day Beirut, Nathaniel, a tradition, one tradition, the earliest tradition, says they tied him in a sack while he was alive and threw him into the sea. Thomas was run through with a spear. I wonder if he remembered in John chapter 20 when Jesus appeared to him in the upper room and showed him his hands and said, put your hands in the, in the nail-scarred hands and put your hand into my side where the spear was and the blood and water flowed. And Thomas had a spear run through him as he died as a martyr for preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. James the Less, the son of Alphaeus, some say he was stoned, others say he was beaten to death. The disciple with three names, Judas, not Iscariot, Judas the son of James, or Labias, or Thaddeus. His symbol is a club today because tradition says he was clubbed to death. Matthias, who replaced Judas in Acts chapter 1, they stoned him, and if that wasn't enough, after they stoned him, they cut his head off. Paul, we know, was beheaded in Rome. Stephen preached one long sermon in Acts chapter 7, and his reward was stoning. You have to say that the disciples took the word to heart when Jesus said, Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. They weren't surprised when they were persecuted and even killed because they expected it because Jesus told them it was coming. 
So the first point this morning, persecution will come. And the second and last point this morning, we must rejoice when persecuted. And all God's people said? That was a hearty amen for persecution this morning. We must rejoice when persecuted. Look at our text, Matthew 5, verse 12. Rejoice, it's a command in the imperative, and the other imperative or command, be glad. Rejoice and be glad for two reasons. Because great is your reward in heaven, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Jesus says we should rejoice and be glad, not if persecution comes, but when it comes, because of the Lord we love and the life that we live. Let's look at the two reasons why we should rejoice and be glad. Number one, for the reward we have in heaven. It doesn't tell us the specific reward that we're going to get in heaven here in this text, but we all know we have a reward of salvation. And that's enough to not let persecution get us down. That's enough to rejoice always. The scripture says, and again I say rejoice, because no matter what happens to us, no one can take our salvation away. Amen? That's enough to praise God for every single day of our life. So number one, we can rejoice and be glad because we have a reward waiting for us in heaven, our salvation in Jesus Christ. And number two, we can rejoice because we're in good company. It says, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you, the same way they persecuted Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, Jeremiah, same way they persecuted Peter. You know who else's company we're in when we're persecuted? Jesus Christ. The greatest company we could ever be in. The one who died for us, was persecuted for us, who took the punishment that we deserve for our sins upon himself on the old rugged cross. We're in his company as well. Blessed are those who are persecuted, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. I wrote this down in my notes because this is a point I don't want you to miss this morning that God really laid on my heart. We should not be surprised when we're persecuted. We should be surprised when we're not persecuted. According to our text this morning. And see, for me, I was so used to persecution coming outside the walls of church when I heard of all these different things happening with friends of mine in the ministry, it blew me away that people in the church act like that. It surprised me. When if I'd have known God's word a little better, I shouldn't have been surprised about it. I should know it's coming. And it will come until God calls us home one day. 1 Peter 4, listen to this text in light of persecution. 1 Peter 4, 12. Dear friends, do not be surprised at the painful trial you are suffering, though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice that you participate in the sufferings of Christ, so that you may be overjoyed when His glory is revealed. If you are insulted because of the name of Christ, you are blessed. For the spirit of glory and of God rests on you. But if you suffer, it should not be as a murderer or as a thief or any kind of criminal or even as a meddler. We shouldn't suffer for being sinners. We should suffer for living for Christ. However, if you suffer as a Christian, do not be ashamed, but praise God that you bear that name. Verse 17 of 1 Peter 4, For it's time for judgment to begin with the family of God. And if it begins with us, what will the outcome be for those who do not obey the gospel of God? I'm preaching through the book of Acts on Sunday morning. And I'm only in chapter 6, working verse by verse through that wonderful book in God's Holy Word in the New Testament. And it's amazing to me when you look at how much persecution the apostles faced. In Acts chapter 5, they're flogged. In verse 40 of Acts chapter 5 and in verse 41, the apostles left the Sanhedrin rejoicing because they've been counted worthy of suffering disgrace for the name. They were beaten severely, and they leave praising God. I can't even begin to imagine that. What that picture must have looked like as they came down the road singing praises to God when they were beaten almost to death. They said, we consider an honor to suffer disgrace because of the name of Jesus Christ. You back up in Acts chapter 5, they are told by the Sanhedrin to stop preaching in the name. They won't even say the name of Jesus, but we know that's the name they're talking about. In Acts 5, 29, Peter and the other apostles say, we must obey God rather than man. What we need today is people in churches who would rather obey God than man, who would rather stand up for what God's Word says we should do as Christians. Number one, 
thing that we should do is to reach this lost and dying world with the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's our great commission. Not the omission that we talk about so much, but the great commission. Do we see people like that today? Do we see people that really preach the word today? I've got friends of mine that are pastors at churches that they have deacons and leaders in the church that tell them they can't preach on certain topics out of God's word. Because if they do, there's people that are in those types of sin in their church and that might offend them and they won't come back. See, the Bible says, 2 Timothy 3, 16, that all scripture is breathed by God and is profitable for correction, to rebuke, to training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. And then you go to the very next verse, 2 Timothy, uh, 2, 2 Timothy 4, 1. In the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who will judge the living and the dead. In the view of his appearing and his kingdom, I give you this charge. Preach the word. Be prepared in season and out of season. Correct, rebuke, and encourage with great patience and careful instruction. For a time is coming. It might already be here. For a time is coming when men will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. They will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths. But in verse 5 of 2 Timothy 4, it says, But you, keep your head in all situations, endure hardships, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill the duties of your ministry. Alistair Begg says he reminds himself of those four things every day. No matter what happens to him at church or outside church, he reminds himself to keep his head in all situations, to endure hardships, to do the work of an evangelist, to share Christ with the lost and dying world, and to discharge or fulfill the duties of his ministry. We must preach the word today. We must stand on God's holy word and not be ashamed of God's holy word. We must obey God rather than men. Even though we might be persecuted, even in the church, even in the church. Ken Hughes, in his commentary on the book of Acts, preaching the word commentary, writes about Richard Wombram, and he describes a joy that I can't even begin to understand. He's being persecuted in a Romanian prison. At times, the tormentors are ripping chunks of flesh off of his body. He's put in for months at a time into solitary confinement, and no one is even allowed to speak to him. But he says he would actually stand up in his cell and dance because he felt like the angels were dancing with him. And he was full of joy. When he was released from the Romanian prison, he was on his way from the prison, walking down the road, and a lady approached him, a peasant woman, with some fresh strawberries. You got to understand that he was, he was in prison. He was beaten. He was starved almost to death. And she offers him some strawberries, and, it's, and Richard Wormbrand reaches his hand out to take the strawberries and then decides, no, I'm going to fast. And he goes home to his wife, and they fast because they want to have the same joy outside of prison that he had inside prison. Mm, where are those people at today? Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven. And so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Well, I want to close this morning. I want to go back to the blog that I read to start off with. What happened in that church? Well, the black and white couple that joined the church, they were already believers in Jesus Christ. They were, the black man had some in-laws. Those in-laws were lost. But because the church received their family and didn't turn them away, a week later, they, they both knelt and prayed to receive Christ their Lord and Savior. were baptized a couple weeks ago. What also happened from that situation was there were three people that could see the church from their house who were never invited to come to church because they didn't look the way other people thought they should look. They weren't in the social status people thought they should be in to come to that church. But they found out through some lies in the community when people said, hey, they don't want certain kind of people in the church, they found out, oh, they're coming, they must want them in the church. They said, if they're welcome, maybe they'll welcome us as well. And those three people came two weeks ago, and they prayed to receive Christ, and they were baptized last Sunday. You know, when it says in God's holy word, great is our reward in heaven, maybe some of the reward in heaven will be other people that find heaven instead of hell. Not only do we get to go to heaven, but when we stand up for what God's holy word says we should stand up for, even in the midst of persecution, we rejoice and be glad, then God honors that. The world doesn't understand it. Some people, even in the church, don't understand it. But don't be surprised. 
God's word tells us persecution will come. It will come for the life that we live, for the Lord that we love. People will insult us. People will persecute us. People will lie about us, spread rumors. It's probably not what you thought the chapel service was going to be like this morning. I get one chance to preach in chapel, and I preach on persecution. That's because God laid it in my heart. Because I think you need to know, many of you that are going to the ministry are already in the ministry. It will come. It should come if you're standing for what God's Word says you should stand for. Don't let it run you out of church and out of the ministry like 50% of people do. See, when Dr. Eccles gave us that stat, I thought, boy, these people just aren't called to ministry. It's been five years after they worked so hard to get their degree, they're out of the ministry. Maybe they're not called is what I thought. But after God showed me some things over the last several months, maybe they are called. Maybe they're just not ready when persecution comes. Maybe they're surprised when persecution comes instead of knowing it will come because God's word promises us that it will. Let's go to God in prayer. Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you, Lord, for what you've shown me and are teaching me through your word. God, I know there's got to be at least one person here that's being persecuted because they're standing up for you at church and trying to do what you've laid on their heart to do. They're trying to reach all people with the gospel of Jesus Christ. So, Lord, encourage them this morning. Help them to do what your word says, to rejoice and be glad. Help them to remember they have a reward in heaven waiting on them. Lord, help them to realize they're in good company, that many others have gone before them and were persecuted because of the Lord that we all love and the life that we live for you. Lord, help us not to be surprised. Help us not to give in to persecution and obey men and not God. Help us not to preach our own philosophy. Help us to preach your word. Lord, help us not to give in to people that are upset just because your word is proclaimed. Lord, you tell us in your word that it is sharp and it's, it penetrates even to the deepest joints and marrow. Lord, every time I preach your word, you convict me and you show me ways in my life that I need to give over to you and live more for you. So, Lord, thank you for your word, your divine holy word. May we take it, may we use it in our life. Lord, help us not to just listen to your word. Help us to be doers as well. Help us to give you the praise and glory for it all, even amidst persecution. In your holy name we pray. Amen.